Welcome to the 10th talk of Human Factors in Design. I'm Joseph Jackman, and today we'll be discussing a very important topic which traditionally, maybe 10, 20 years ago, might not have been fully integrated in human factors and ergonomics discussions, but today tends to form a, an integral part of the topic. So the topic of emotion, human emotions. First of all, to be completely clear, what are we referring to when we say the word emotion? Uh, if we look in the dictionary, any of the standard dictionaries, we'll find the fact that emotion as a word is a noun, and the definitions will involve words like feeling, a state of feeling, a conscious mental reaction, there's always a discussion about it being subjectively experienced, and usually there's an intentionality or direction towards specific objects, uh, and there's always some mention of some physiological bodily feeling or response. So we think something, there's an emotion in terms of our thoughts, but there's also some sort of reaction in the body to this uh, feeling. Emotion may surprise that the word and the concept is actually relatively new. The word emotion, uh, most uh, linguistic studies seem to indicate that it was first used in the 1500s during the Renaissance. So you might ask yourself, what did people in the ancient world, in antiquity, what did they think about emotional reactions? People getting mad, people getting happy, people getting sad, people falling in love, and so forth. Well, basically, in antiquity, emotions were often, in Latin or Greek texts, referred to as animal spirits or spirits, simply of the gods, affecting us. So there was a sensation or a thought process until fairly recently that there was what we would today refer to as cognitive, rational thought, and there were moments in which spirits took us over, either spirits internal to us or working from outside of us, there really wasn't a clear recognition of the fact that emotion is an intrinsic, basic part of us. It's part of everything we do. And you can't even be rational and think rationally without being able to emotionally weigh which are the good options that make us happy from the bad options that make us sad. So the recognition of how important and central emotion is is a relatively recent thing. So, what does emotion involve? There's several standard definitions. The one I'll refer to here is a, a very popular one by Scherer. And Scherer uh, outlines or suggests five basic things you can look for, and if they're all there, definitely we're talking about an emotion. There's usually a cognitive appraisal of some situation, some event, or some object. I find myself fall about to fall off the step, I see the step, I see me, I, I think what could happen, there's a cognitive appraisal, in this case of the danger of the situation, it may make me feel fear. Internal feelings experienced by the individual, when you get emotional, uh, happy or sad, it's a bodily sensation. Nervousness, ahead of a public speaking uh, situation, a talk, can make your tummy a bit agitated and so forth. So what the brain evaluates and how the brain reacts as every part of the body is connected and the brain is connected to everything else, other parts of the body uh, react and adjust based on the evaluations which the brain is making. Physiological symptoms, uh, upset stomach, uh, depression, and so forth. Action tendencies, if there's an emergency, the feeling of fear will prime your muscles to jump and to do something. Some of these superhuman feats that people do. A child gets trapped under a car and a very small person goes and lifts the car to let the child out. And you ask yourself, 
how did such a small person manage to lift that car enough for the child to get out? These superhuman tendencies and these superhuman achievements usually occur because the emotions prime the muscles, they release cortisol, they release adrenaline, they release all kinds of hormones and neurotransmitters, and they permit a person to do something exceptional for a, v a very brief period of time. And then usually there's external manifestations by means of facial expressions or changes in vocal properties. When you're talking to a friend who's very sad, you can usually hear that in your friend's voice. When you're talking to a friend or a neighbor who's uh, become very happy due to some surprise event which really made their day, you can again hear it in the voice and you can see it on the smile of the face. So emotions always reveal themselves to other people via our voice, our face, and our various communication mechanisms. And this is an evolutionary result which permits us to live together. Imagine living in a society where people were lying to you all the time and trying to trick you and cheat you, and nothing ever showed up on their face or voice to warn you that there may be more to it than what the person is saying. To live together, we have to be not just capable of interpreting spoken language, natural language, we also have to be able to read that and look for inconsistencies via body language, voice, facial expressions, and so forth. So, emotions, what kind of theories, what kind of reasonings, what kinds of thoughts have people had in the past when they approached this issue and tried to study it and consider it. One of the early uh, ways of thinking about emotions, what's described here, which is the cultural theory of emotion. In the 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries, uh, this was a relatively common way of thinking emotion. And where did this come from? Imagine explorers traveling to North America, South America, Africa, Asia, people maybe leaving Europe, going around the world and finding themselves in places with people who look very different from them, who seem to talk a different language from them, they have different habits, they eat different foods, the climate locally is different, and they see different behaviors. They see things, maybe they make a joke, and the local people don't laugh at it, they don't think it's so funny. Uh, you notice differences and you begin to assume that the differences also in the emotions, when a person's happy, sad, laughing, crying, and so forth, that these emotions, just like the languages, just like the food, just like the local architecture, just like the clothing which changes, as so many other things change sociologically from one place to another, one group of people to another, an assumption was made that probably the emotional reactions of people may be changing in the same manner, just like the language. Spanish is different from French, is different from English. Maybe the emotions of Spanish people are different from those of French people or English people. This was sort of logic that was in place at a time when travel was limited and very few people had the luxury and the opportunity to visit faraway lands and notice differences of all sorts and possibly there was the assumption that the emotions changed as well. However, in the mid 20th century, these kinds of thoughts began to change because scientific research began to note that many different animals seem to react in ways which share some of our emotional responses to similar circumstances. They began to note that yes, in different places in the world, people may look a little different, they may speak a different language, they may have different preferences in architecture, food and other issues, but actually we're very much alike and we seem to be behaving in a similar manner everywhere as human beings. So one very famous set of studies 
attributed to Paul Ekman in the mid 20th century. He tends to be considered a bit the father of this line of thinking. What the gentleman did was he said, let's go study this in detail. What did he do? He took a series of photographs of people in the United States. I think it was in the San Francisco area in California. He took a set of pictures of people when they were expressing different emotions with their face. The pictures were taken very carefully, selected, filtered, and treated very carefully so as to just catch the face, to be roughly the same size face within the frame of each image. Basically, the backgrounds were normalized and so forth. So a rather scientific set of pictures where the main thing that was changing was the facial expression of the person. And all these images were put in some sort of a catalog or ring binder or something. And the gentleman went to New Guinea, found a part of the world where in the upper highlands, distant from the coast, there hadn't yet been electrification. There hadn't yet been uh, mass usage of radios and telephones and televisions and so forth. So he took these images with him and went into villages where there were people who to a first approximation could have been considered as having been isolated or separate from mainstream international uh, societies uh, up until that point. And the idea was, let me show some pictures of people or let me describe some situations and have them match the pictures. And let's see if a person who lives in this community has never had any contact with these American people who are in the images, let's see if the person chooses the same pictures in response to the same situations or to the same descriptions of different emotional states. And on his return, he did the same thing in the other direction. When uh, the local people were telling stories and they had facial expressions in response and reaction to the stories, he took large numbers of pictures and then selected them and prepared them again in a similar manner, such that there were pictures of a person smiling and happy, a person sad, a person disgusted, a person upset, whatever and asked American people back home to associate and say which emotions were being shown in the images or which of these were appropriate responses to certain stories which were being read and presented to the participants. And lo and behold, what Elk Ekman suggested was that from all the work he was doing and all the data that was collected in both directions, it did seem like certain basic emotions were expressed with the face and they were understood to mean the same things in linguistic and narrative terms by the people of both communities, communities which had never been in contact. Thus, they must be to some degree hardwired in us. They must be part of our neural architecture of our nervous system. They must somehow be hardwired reactions which are part of the pattern recognition, the interpretation and understanding of our world and our preparations for responding to that world in different situations. So he basically concluded that there were things which today are referred to as basic emotions or universal emotions or innate, meaning hardwired emotions. And at the time, at least six were proposed to exist, and they are the ones that are shown here. Joy, happy, distress, unhappy, fear, scared, anger, mad, upset, surprise, and disgust. Oh, don't want that, I don't like that, I have to get rid of that, get it out of my view, get it out of my way. These six innate or basic emotions were suggested to be natural response patterns, natural ways of responding to conditions which were judged by our nervous system to be of a certain type. So they were pre-programmed things which probably helped us to survive for all these hundreds of thousands of years. 
And over the years, further studies were done and more complex endeavors were embarked upon and a whole field of research, of course, in academic circles was born and much more has been described since. And one of the developments after the time of Ekman was many people have suggested that the basic or hardwired emotions are not the complete story. And not only that, but they've suggested that the basic hardwired ones, which are very primitive and go probably very far back in our evolution, they might be very survival related to early man, early people, but in more recent times we've continued to evolve and we've begun to develop other emotions which aren't as strong because they're relatively newer in evolutionary terms, but they are emotions and even though they may be a little bit less strong or a little bit slower to activate, they are definitely part of our pattern recognizing and automatic responses to the things that happen to us in life. And the higher order or higher cognitive emotions is a list of emotions of the more recent type. And in this category, various people will propose uh, emotions such as the ones listed here, love, guilt, shame, embarrassment, pride, envy, jealousy, and other lists will be slightly longer, but it's you get the idea it's this sort of more complex and more cognitive appraisals of the situation. And the proposal is that in more recent evolutionary terms, times, these things have emerged because we have to live together in villages, in towns, in cities, in metropolises today. So these higher cognitive emotions are evolutionary responses to the fact that we're not living in ones and twos and threes isolated on a savanna or in a forest. We're living in large communities and the social interactions between different people start to become just as important for success, happiness and survival as might have been these very basic emotions of getting scared so you run away in more distant and primitive times. And, of course, uh, academics being academics, there's many, many studies have been performed over the years and various systems of emotions have been proposed by various researchers and some can be rather complete and complex and extensive. This is one of the more uh, complete and extensive ones that's been suggested over the years. This is by Parot in 2001. And what you can see is uh, various studies lead people to suggest that there are some primary or basic ones which are very influential in everything we do because they go way back and they're very hardwired to core thought processes of the mind. There's secondary emotions which are subtle variations of those primary ones, so they might be a little bit less strong but they're of the same type and they occur in specific circumstances. And then there's feelings, which are milder, more contextually specific. They're more typical of a given situation rather than another one, whereas the basic ones will, will appear over and over again in many different circumstances. These uh, feelings might be a little bit more related to specific situations that occur in our life. So whole systems with branching networks of emotions, with words, and in each language the words that would be in a table like this may be slightly different, and because of language differences they don't always make a perfect overlap and a perfect fit one to another, but the basics and at least the secondary emotions get relatively well expressed in most languages. Now, if those are the systems of emotions, do designers have to keep in mind that some may be stronger than others, or some should be used in some circumstance and not in others? Are there any observations or guidelines that we can uh, take on board and consider? Well, there's a couple. There's a couple very simple rules of thumb. The first one, negative emotions tend to be the stronger ones. Uh, negative emotions, the speculation amongst the researchers is 
survival of the species was much more dependent on the negative emotions. If, if an animal tries to eat you, you need to get scared and run away quick. Uh, if you pick up a food and it doesn't taste quite right, you need to get disgusted and throw it away without eating it because it might be poisonous. So there's much speculation about the fact that in evolutionary terms, survival required very, very much negative feedback. You have to know when something's wrong if you are to survive. And this is a general principle also of information theory. Negative feedback is usually incredibly important. You learn a lot more from a mistake than you do from a success. So negative emotions tend to be considered the stronger and designers, marketing experts, neuromarketing experts, branding experts, everyone is aware of this and integrates this sort of consideration into their work. For example, in the 1980s, it became very apparent to experts and professionals in the car industry that you are going to sell a lot more of your cars if your TV commercial emphasizes the fact that it's the most crash safe vehicle in its category if the crash safety rating is very high compared to some of the more obvious competitors and if your TV commercial has a family with small children in particular the small babies in the child seat in the back you will sell a lot of that car because negative emotions being afraid of what's going to happen if there's a car accident and your child is injured is going to produce a stronger emotion than a car that looks beautiful and is sporty and whatever so uh, there's also issues of different people have different expectations different values and priorities however as a general rule of thumb if you need to sell quite often negative uh, considerations can be very powerful. Don't vote for the other political party. They're going to ruin the country and sink the economy. Vote for my political party. We know how to run the economy. Everyone will have a great job and do well. Classic example all through history. That's, that sort of statement has been repeated over and over. And it comes from this. Positive emotions, not to downplay the positive emotions, because the positive emotions are incredibly powerful and very influential as well. But they tend to be used or deployed by professionals in different circumstances. Positive emotions are usually noted from studies in psychology and sociology as emotions that help to broaden the thinking process. They favor play and exploration, they favor social interaction. The positive emotions are things which bring people together, which permits interactions, which help to grow physical resources, intellectual resources, social resources, and psychological resources. So, no surprise that in elementary school system, so much of what you see in the classroom and so many of the activities are intended to stimulate play and happiness and positive emotions. Uh, in many circumstances, you get a lot more uh, activity and you get a lot better results with the carrot than you do with the stick. So positive emotions have a fundamental role in a whole variety, including healthcare and other sectors. It has uh, a very key role in those, whereas in some other situations, the negative ones, of course, are the obvious choice. Now, how do we measure emotions? If, if I'm designing something, a product, a system, or a service, and I have some doubt about how people might respond to some aspect of my design, the color, the number of buttons, the one of the functions it performs, the way it talks when it has voice recognition and voice response and so forth. Um, there are many ways to measure how a person responds to a situation or, a, or an extended interaction with a product, a system, or a service. Now, I'm only going to have time here to introduce a couple of the more famous and more popular 
of the methods which people in design community tend to use. There's lots more and there's lots that are highly specialized to specific design tasks that the designer is trying to achieve. But these uh, two or three that I'm going to introduce are, are very useful and you know I myself use them all the time and they're very helpful particularly uh, for doing things in a simple and relatively quick and efficient manner. First of the methods, the SAM, the Stimulus uh, se excuse me, Self-Assessment Mannequin, S-A-M, Self-Assessment Mannequin SAM. This is a very popular one, goes back quite a few years. It's been used in hundreds of studies over the years for different applications in psychology, sociology, design, engineering, and other fields. Basically, it's a very simple approach. What you're seeing here is the version based on two parameters. Uh, there's also a SAM version based on three, but the one with two is a little bit more popular in, in everyday usage. So what are these two parameters? They are referred to as the valence and the activation. The valence, as the word suggests, is, is the emotion of the type you would describe as positive or happy, or is it instead of the type you would describe more as negative or sad? So valence is the sign, plus or minus, if we want to look at it in uh, mathematical notation, it's the sign of the emotion that's expressed. Instead, the other parameter that's measured in the two-factor variant is activation, because I can be happy, but then I then have to say, how much of the happy? Is it a little? Is it a lot? Is it the absolute maximum I can ever imagine being happy? So there's always the question of what is the effect on me in terms of valence, good or bad, positive or negative, and what is the size or the magnitude or the extent of that feeling? Because uh, yes, maybe it makes me happy, but so little, it's not a big deal, I, I hardly noticed it. So the SAM method is a self-evaluation or self-assessment method typically on a sheet of paper, often on a computer screen as part of an automated test. It can, it can be put on the dashboard of the car if you're testing an automobile. The point is the person is asked to have some interaction to perform some task or experience some condition or talk to some person and have some interaction with another person. And at the end of that task, often timed, how many seconds or minutes of duration, at the end of that you pull out the sheet and say, okay, now rate how you feel emotionally based on what just happened. So how you feel right now as we give you the sheet to fill in. So the person might say, well, I feel a happiness, a bit positive, maybe a seven out of nine and I feel, though, not much activation, maybe just a two out of nine, the activation. And you ask the people to do this many times, more than once, so you can do some averages. You ask different people, and you choose your personas and the scenarios of the evaluation very carefully to match the product or service design specification, and you collect quite a bit of data, could be through virtual simulation, could be in reality, someone sitting in a real car or in an office or whatever. You collect the data and you might collect it for your prototype, your nearest competitor, and maybe an alternate prototype, and then you can compare the results and see if you were on the right track and yours is better than the competitor and maybe hopefully even better than the alternative design. So these are simple ways to check is the person having a positive emotional experience with the interaction. There's various scales. A more complex one is this one here uh, developed by Desmet in 2002 for specific use in evaluating automobiles. The idea here was facial expressions can be more informative and there's more of them than just what a mannequin like the Sam is suggesting. The Sam sort of has a smile when it's happy and a frown when it's not. 
but there's more subtle variations. There are six basic emotions and at least a dozen of the higher order cognitive. Maybe we can draw pictures which capture this wider variety of facial expression and maybe we can bring the body language into play. Because if you're sitting on the other side of this video with your arms crossed like this and leaning back on your chair, it probably means you're not liking what I'm saying and you're not paying much attention to what I'm talking about. Because something like this is a motion of closure with the body. Body language, the body, just like the face and the voice, the pitch of the voice, the body also gives away how you're feeling emotionally inside. So here we have a set of mannequins where the facial expressions vary much more than what's the case with the Sam. And we have a set of body postures to back up, support, and reinforce what's being shown on the face. So we have a, a, a wider, more holistic image or cartoon of the emotion involved. And again, you would put a person in a certain scenario, certain amount of time, and then say, now choose the cartoon which is closest to what, how you think you feel right now. Put an X on the box. This is another method of evaluating that's been used quite a bit in the car industry. And then one very, very popular one, particularly with computer interfaces, things like internet portals or cell phone apps, in systems where, yes, there's some visual content, but there's a lot of text and a lot of the interaction is via text. You can think of Twitter as being a very good example or email as being another one. Where there's a lot of verbal, linguistic, textual content and interaction, this tends to be the preferred method of use uh, for evaluating emotions. And it's the Geneva, as in Geneva, Switzerland, emotion wheel. Uh, what you can see is from a number of studies performed by a set of research groups, there was a conclusion that the basic and the higher order emotions, if you look at their structure and how they relate to each other, you will see a structure where the concepts of valence are there, as in the SAM, but there's an also another dimension called control. You can see the up and down line, high control, low control. So what they noticed was that the way a person responds emotionally can be positive or negative, but what the SAM refers to as intensity they found quite often is directly the result of the feeling of how much control a person has over the situation. If something goes wrong, but there's no implications, and it was my choice, and it's not a big deal, and okay, it cost me five quid, but it's not the end of the world, no problem. But if something goes wrong, and it's costing the university many thousands of uh, pounds and my line manager or the vice chancellor is going to show up and try to fire me and I have very little control over that process, the emotional reaction can be very different. In a similar manner to what we discussed previously in a previous talk with in relation to workload when it's not self-paced, well, emotions are very dependent on how much control we have over it. If we get the feeling we, we're not really able to affect the situation, it, it amplifies the feeling of the emotion. So here we have two dimensions, and we have around the ring, you can see the names, uh, guilt, embarrassment, worry, uh, pity, longing, tenderness, amusement, involvement, irritation. So we have a set of words which are capturing subtle uh, emotions, not just the six basic ones. And what we can do is we expose a person to a situation, we let them do something, complete some task or whatever, and then we say, tell me how you feel now by choosing one or more of these and then the circles from the inside to the outside, from the little circle in the middle to the large one on the outer ring, those are five steps and they represent five levels of intensity. The 
uh, what the SAM was measuring with the intensity or, or the amplitude uh, evaluation. Give us, put an X on which of the circles next to which of the words you think express how you feel. So for things that are heavily linguistic, such as Twitter or email, this is usually a preferred method of emotional evaluation. And nowadays, something that's uh, becoming more and more popular, it's, it's becoming very widely used as we speak, is the issue or the methodology of facial emotion coding systems. I can put a camera on a person looking at their face, either in a room or at the checkout counter at the Tesco or on the dashboard of the car. I can put a tiny little camera looking at the person's face and I can use neural network based or, or pattern recognizing algorithms to detect from the face's shape which of the emotions are involved. It's called facial emotion analysis, FEA. There's lots of uh, technologies, lots of systems based on simple optical cameras with a little bit of machine learning or neural network based algorithm behind it and they will in real time say this person seems to be happy by about this much this person seems to be angry about this much and dan hill in a book called emotionomics already in the early 2000s emphasized the power and the usefulness of this sort of real-time technology-based emotion detection. You don't have to, to, to invest the resources and the time you need uh, to do the ones where you fill out scales and do self-assessments and rate things. This can be real-time. It can be built into the checkout counter at the Tesco or into the car, and it can be used for purposes of deciding things such as how the car should respond to a control input from the driver. So Dan Hill uh, discussed this quite extensively and emphasized a set of points which are definitely uh, important in design. What the gentleman insisted upon was that feelings, meaning emotions, will occur faster than will the cognitive thinking processes with greater speed. So if you wait for the person to reason their way through the situation and evaluate something and tell you what they think about something, it's going to take orders of magnitude longer than just reading their face because the emotion system and the pulling that it automatically does on the facial muscles is almost instantaneous. It's a few tenths of a second. Conscious thought is only a small part of mental activity. If I say to you, why did you have a Coca-Cola as your drink at lunch today? You may stop and think about it for a few minutes and come up with lots of rational explanations about why you like Coca-Cola, your dad introduced it to you when you were a child, and so forth and so on. But the fact of the matter is, you're rationalizing and backfilling. Your hand reached out, it grabbed the Coca-Cola probably within seconds, a couple of seconds of when you passed it on the shelf in the shop. You took it and you've now drunk it and it's for reasons that aren't completely clear in your conscious thought. Many of them are in your subconscious, the reasons why you like that particular product. Another point uh, driven home by Dan Hill in his work, emotion, drives reason more than the other way around. Emotions uh, inform and shape the kind of rational things we can think about, not so much the other way around. And then finally, most things we do, uh, we tend to consider the emotions involved. Yes, I could change jobs, and move to another place of work where they'll pay me some more money and rationally that money could be put to good use for my family for certain things but that particular place of work I know would make me unhappy each day and I don't want to put myself 
my body, my mind into a situation of unhappiness because that, that has very severe health and other consequences. So we tend to decide things, almost all things in life, more based on emotional considerations. Make me happy, make me sad, it's, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. These kinds of subjective judgments, we tend to decide most of the things we do much more on that than on any of the practical, rational, the rational consumer, the capitalist rational model of uh, supply demand. There's all kinds of models used to understand society which are rational, analytical, and scientific in nature, but unfortunately, much of the time, probably most of the time, it's not those considerations which are shaping a person's actual behavior. A classic example of the difference between rational thought and socially acceptable responses and communications on the one hand, and what a person's emotions are responding and what they really want on the other hand, is what in emotionomics is uh, talked about quite a bit, which is the well-known phenomena of the say feel gap. This particular data set is from uh, in relation to a particular set of TV commercials that were shown to panels of uh, participants who watch these. And on the left hand side, we have the little pie chart of what they said. So they saw a TV commercial and they were asked to say whether they liked it or they didn't like it, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. There were some questions. And the left-hand pie chart is what they said. 58% said, yes, great stuff. And 42% said, no, no, don't really like that, don't think that was appropriate. The facial coding, with a camera sitting on the wall in the room, with the same people recording them in real time, as they were watching, and then as they responded uh, to the questions, the facial camera, that was picking up automatically and giving us how much happy, how much sad, how much disgusted, and so forth, it says a very different story. Instead of 58%, yes, that's a good thing, the faces, there were only 31% of the people seem to have a bit of approval, smiling, happy, something that indicates a positive valence. Almost 70% in this particular test were suggesting a negative valence, meaning they really didn't like them. And regardless of what they said on the questionnaire, it's not very likely they're going to buy one of those things or use one of those things or agree to vote for that political party or whatever it was that was the object of the, of the TV commercial. So this say feel gap, people will express things dependent on cognitive reasoning, which is a backfilling, rationalizing operation, which misses a lot of the key facts, and or social pressures, things that you feel are acceptable to say, but it's not necessarily exactly how you feel or what you really think. This gap is enormous, and how the designers design things when the participants they're working with may not give them the most transparent, useful, feedback possible. Another uh, consideration in relation to emotions is the question of when the response occurs, where it occurs, and what's affecting the response. Because people, of course, will respond slightly differently to the same scenario on different days. They'll respond slightly differently when they're with different people, etc., etc. So there's a question of how does the situated nature of the emotion affect it? Emotions don't occur in a vacuum. They're not in an empty white room. They're occurring on the street, in the office, in real time, with people around you while you're doing things. And one model that's been uh, considered and used a lot by designers over the years is Desmet's uh, understanding of it or, or suggestion in terms of a model for it. And the model is what's shown here in this image. There's a product 
or a surface which a designer is trying to design and maybe has a preliminary concept, has some idea about, there's a set of concerns or values or desires and requirements and needs of the person involved, the participant, whoever it is you're talking to about this design. The two come together and there's a, an appraisal. There's a deep, subconscious, rapid, psychological, subconscious, emotional appraisal. Then there's a slightly slower, a uh, little bit longer, a little bit more rational cognitive appraisal, and the two interact together and shape each other to some extent. And then there is the emotion. So you come into some context where there's some product and some situation, you bring with you a set of expectations, values, needs, desires, boom, there's an interaction and there's an automatic response which develops uh, part of it within milliseconds and then the longer cognitive aspects will take seconds or minutes or maybe hours to fully develop. Now, how much power does a designer have over these kinds of situations. You know, it's nice to know all the theory from psychology and sociology about human emotion. It's good to have an understanding of what shapes it and which ones are available and what might happen. And it's nice to know you could measure it. But there's still the question of when I sit down with a pencil and paper and I start sketching out some concepts as a designer in the early part of the work, how much control do I actually have over this? How much of this depends on me and my work as a designer? Or, you know, is it totally within the mind of the person who interacts with my product? Is it really only about them? Or does my product really have an effect on this interaction and shape it? Well, surprisingly so, a designer has quite a bit of power and quite a bit of influence over what might be the emotional reaction of a person when they encounter the product or service in a given context. And just to give a, a little bit of flavor, because this on its own could be a topic for several hours of conversation, but just to give a little bit of flavor to, 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 to show some of the aspects of it, a couple of slides I'd like to present give you some idea of just how quickly things can change from an emotional point of view. 1924, 500 students in the United States were given by their university teachers some sheets of paper, sheet of white paper, on which a line was drawn with a pencil or a marker. And the line could be of different shapes. Maybe the sheet has one line and it's the one maybe that's shown here that's referred to as sad. It's just a slowly moving sinusoid wave. Or maybe it's a set of zigzags, like the one that's shown here, labeled as powerful. Or maybe it's a bunch of zigzags moving upwards over the course of the distance, which is the one that's labeled agitating. The point is, sheets of perfectly normal sheets of A4 paper, which is a big line across the middle, they give it to people, and they ask people to answer questions about these and to fill in blanks and express how they feel, how this line makes them feel. And the results of this suggest what's shown on this particular image here, which is every time, almost on each occasion, where there was a gentle sinusoidal wave of the type shown as sad up there that was going downwards, People would use words like sad, melancholy, sorryful, and so forth. If the sinusoid, exact same squiggle, if the sinusoid was running side to side almost perfectly horizontally, it would be referred to as quiet, calm, and so forth. If it was a bunch of zigzags, it would have some words like forceful, strong, exciting, fiery. If it's going upwards, it's one set of words. If it's going upwards a little bit more, it's a different set of words, and so forth and so on. So here we can see, uh, never mind the shape of a product, never mind the geometrics and, and the aesthetics, the complete picture, just an edge 
just an edge, just a line, the corner of, of one of the components, uh, a line running across the front of the computer casing, and so forth and so on. Just looking at edges and lines without colors, without complex shapes, without anything that resembles anything from nature, just the nature of a simple line is being associated by people routinely it's it's consistent across the different people you know 400 of people would have said weak for the one that's in the middle of the top 400 out of 500 maybe it's consistently being described by people in a certain manner they're saying they're feeling a certain way when they see it so a designer if a designer can get a feeling out of a line clearly out of a product geometry or an interaction pattern of a uh, internet website or an app, there's much space for shaping the emotional reaction. And as we've described in a previous talk, KISS metrics uh, routinely changes the interfaces of the sales portals of theirs and some of their customers and they change simple parameters like the color of the buy button or the shape of the buy button or the font of the buy button and so forth and as we've shown previously you can get quite dramatic differences in purchasing uh, of products online from an online sales you can get dramatic purchasing differences just by changing the font or changing the color because you're getting you're stimulating by that font shape or that particular color, one emotion rather than another. And if an emotion matches well the nature of the product and the nature of the need or desire the person went to the website and brought with them, you've got a good match and you've got a better chance that they may like it and, uh, and possibly purchase it. Now, uh, another aspect that's worth noting with emotions is quite often, in design, uh, emotions will be described as positive characteristics which we try to shape and, and control to some degree, uh, often for purposes of commercial success. I will sell more cars if I can make a strong case that mine is safer. I might sell more of the sports car, the slightly different one, if I can make a strong case that it's aesthetically pleasing, that it's very good looking or very fast or some other uh, on the positive uh, scale of emotion. We tend to assume or associate emotions with things like sales, um, success. But emotion can be used, it can be leveraged, it can be a fundamental aspect of design for many, many purposes that have nothing to do necessarily with the sales. For example, one of the approaches championed some years ago by Jonathan Chapman, he has a nice little book I highly recommend, it's very enjoyable, it's a lovely little read, very nice and very practical. Um, Chapman discusses the topic of emotional durability. The premise perhaps not a hundred percent explanation of what's going on, but there's no doubt there's an aspect of that in what's going on. And the premise of the story is a lot of the electronic waste, the mountains of electronic waste of old cell phones, old fax machines, old printers, old laptops and so forth, that's ending up in landfill or filling up uh, warehouses and recycling centers, a lot of that actually still worked fine and still met most or all of the needs of the owner, of the person who was using it prior to discarding it. But a big part of the reason people change phones, change uh, computers, change all kinds of electrical appliances in the home is that they don't have any emotional connection or they fall out of love, fall out of emotional connection with the particular artifact at some point and are thus very happy to move on and try a new one. So the, the, the point that's made, the observation that's made by Chapman is perhaps we could reduce some of the, the, the waste and improve the environmental sustainability of many electronic products 
if we could just create a greater amount of emotional engagement, which was longer lasting and thus emotionally durable, lasts in time, as opposed to, oh, it's last year's model, doesn't mean much to me, I'll get this year's model and see if it's got a new button on it or a new function on it. And the kinds of examples which Chapman's book is full of uh, are things of this sort. For example, your grandmother's kitchen table. Many of you who are listening to this talk now will probably quickly associate, as I do, that we will have had family members who had furniture in their house, in the living room, in the kitchen, in the dining room, and the furniture is Lord knows how old it is, and it's all scratched, and it's worn out, and we've probably told our grandmother a million times, or our grandfather, please, you know, let me buy you a new table, your kitchen table's all marked and ruined and so forth, and there's no way under the sun that we will convince these people to change the table. And when we're children, we, we, we may not understand this behavior. You know, there's a new one, there's a better one, it's more functional, it's aesthetically more pleasing. Why are you hanging on to this old piece of furniture with a, with a half-broken leg? Well, the reason is because something like a kitchen table is an example of an artifact, a traditional design artifact, which is highly emotionally durable. On that table, there's scratches that you put when you were playing with your toy in your grandma's kitchen when you were seven years old. There's a little ding in the corner where your sister fell over and bumped with her helmet or toy or whatever against the side of the table and put a little notch in it. The table isn't just a functional artifact for holding things up while you sit and you work or you eat. The table is a family record. It's a family photo album. It's, it's part of the family history. That table has scratches and, and discolorations and damages from probably every member of the family at any point in time and your grandmother or your grandfather can look down at it and each scratch and each discoloration brings some memory to mind and thus makes their life more meaningful, reminds them of people they care about, makes life more deeper and more thoughtful and more enjoyable. So emotional durability is about us imprinting things upon the artifacts, products, systems, services, that we interact with, and a lot of electronic equipment unfortunately does not naturally lend itself, it doesn't provide so much affordance for that, and certainly much of it has not been intentionally designed yet, and it might be changing at the moment actually, but not much has been yet designed to create emotional engagement, emotional durability. Thus, there is no scratch reminding me of my sister when she was seven years old. Therefore, given the new one has a new button, it's off and it's in the waste bin. And that's the end of that. And that, of course, is a, a serious issue for sustainability. There's a limit to how much we can do this kind of thing. There's a limit to how much we can recycle and dispose of in a safe manner. So emotional durability which is often a question related to sustainability, um, is not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about emotions, but it's one of the many, many ways a designer can use their understanding of emotions to do things which will have benefits in other areas. Now for the design classics, a um, couple very obvious examples. The, one of the most important ones from my point of view is the emoticon. The emoticon, the little symbols we were using on our, tel on our cell phones when we were texting people before emojis came along and gave us more complete and more interesting and better versions of this. The early emoticon, and we're talking about the early 1980s, the birth of this was not due to a designer, it was due to an electronics digital communications engineer. 
And it wasn't invented based on the fact that it could be a clever, cheeky way to, to send some information about the emotions we're feeling when we're writing the sentence in the message, and it makes the message easier to understand and more meaningful. This was part of uh, uh, an invention and observation which came from the fact that digital communication networks have a lot of times when the traffic loading is not so high, people aren't all on the phone talking at the same time, maybe at the end of the football match, everyone's calling everybody else to talk about it, so there the phone network is heavily loaded, but there's times in the middle of the night or certain gaps during the day when the phone network, the lines, are not fully utilized. And the idea here was, let's put text messaging as a service by sending these signals on the digital telephone network and we can send it asynchronously, unlike a phone call where the other person has to be talking to you at the same time, we can send this information in the gaps when people not using the network so much to talk. And these text messages can provide quite a lot of useful information to people. Not always you need to talk to someone, you can just send them a simple text to confirm you've landed at the airport, you've arrived at the hotel, mom everything is fine uh, you know don't worry everything's great uh, and in the text messages people started putting you know the colon and the dash and the bracket together to make a smiley this was not intended to transmit emotion this was never invented this was just simply let's send some text over the phone network asynchronously it'd be a great way to use the network in times when it's under loaded and it'll help people because you know it doesn't have to arrive in milliseconds as long as it arrives it might be like a letter it carries some useful information but people started using it to express their emotions because sometimes that's all you need does your mom and dad really need to know every detail about your flight to hong kong do they need to know that there was turbulence after you took off from Heathrow? Do they need to know that the chicken wasn't very good in the meal? Do they need to know that the person next to you was a bit noisy and a bit irritating? Your mom and your dad probably just want to know they've landed in Hong Kong and they're fine and happy. That's all they want to know. And a smiley like this is all you need. Because emotions are so central and so fundamental to human life that most of the time the words we're using when we talk to each other are added baggage. It's just extra. You know, when you see your friend smiling, job done, box ticked. You don't need to know all the reasons and all the details. That wasn't the point of the exercise. What you're really looking for, in many, many circumstances, much more than most people actually consider, is simple interaction with a person, whatever it is, for whatever reason, you just want to get a result. Happy, sad, angry, disgusted, whatever. Whatever is contextual to that situation. And this is all you need. So people started texting smileys or frownies or whatever they are in different circumstances and no words were actually needed much of the time in the message. So the emoticon is a fantastic example of something that grew organically, it wasn't initially intended, but it's typical of human beings. This was a way of transmitting information about emotion, which is actually, in many cases, all the people wanted to know. And then another great example related to emotion, which uh, benefits from the things we've discussed in, in this talk, Anna G. Anna G. by Alessi, 1990s, designed by Mendini. Uh, Anna G. is a lovely corkscrew for opening bottles such as wine bottles. And Anna G. is clearly, as you can see, a corkscrew where the designers cleverly noted that a traditional corkscrew of the type typically used in Italy for generations looks a little bit like a person. Looks like there's some arms going on there. Looks like a person. So Mendini uh, emphasizes it and puts a nice smiley face on it. Now, this may just seem like a toy 
or just a clever aesthetic maybe somewhat semiotic gimmick but Anna G is genius this is much deeper than just simply a bit of aesthetics because Anna G is smiling very wide smile on her face that's not a Mona Lisa smile that's a proper smile and what Mendini is tapping into here is the fact that we've come to realize the science behind it in the last decade but people have known for generations that if you smile the people around you that you're interacting with will tend to smile and science has established in the last decade or two that there's something called mirror as in the mirror you look in mirror neurons are active in parts of the cortex mirror neurons are nervous cells neurons which are connected across different lines in such a way that if I start doing this and start rocking back and forth as I talk to you without realizing it you might start rocking back and forth on the other side of this video because these mirror neurons are there to facilitate and bring up the electrical current on those connection lines and they're there to facilitate and prepare the ground for imitation or replication of what the other person is doing and it's part of our evolution as social creatures if I'm really really happy and I'm telling you about what a great day I have and you're frowning it's going to be very hard to have a positive productive conversation if you're upset and crying and I'm laughing uh, again it's going to be very difficult to have a, a productive exchange between the two people so uh, mirror neurons are hardwired structures there from birth which are in our nervous system to help us to empathize emulate copy and imitate the other people around us to some degree so as a group we can all get into the same mood or we can all do similar things at the same time the genius here is if i put a smiley face on the corkscrew and the corkscrew sitting in the kitchen where everyone's standing just the fact that every now and then i turn around and i see it there'll be a little tendency in me to smile as well and medical studies again over the last maybe 20 30 years have demonstrated over and over again that a happy person is a much healthier person than a sad person and it's surprisingly so something like your nails of your finger or your skin or your hair can grow several millimeters a day more when you're happy than when you the same person is sad and medical research has demonstrated this in so many ways and so many times and so many applications so the genius here is we have something which of course is pleasing it's enjoyable it's different it's a conversation starter it's an icebreaker it's sitting in the kitchen it's lovely but the genius is if I actually look at that for a few seconds for some reason I'll be tempted to smile and that's only a good thing it's not just a nice feeling it's medically a good thing for me to have and me to do and then finally the Apple iPod Apple products um, have many design characteristics which are cited in books and in literature as keys to their success very important characteristics it, it, there's lots of good design going on in a product by Apple but um, there's more to it than just the simplified aesthetics or the highly rational functional capabilities of these devices or even the fact that you know they were introduced in such a manner as to introduce a slightly different lifestyle for people and thus they have lifestyle into it. there's something deeper than that which is a device like this where you have one button maximum two that you click it and then you click it again and then magically the music begins to play in your ear or in the environment more widely if it's connected to something the fact that you can get 
a music that you wanted with maybe as little as two or maximum three clicks. One, two, three, music. That's not electronics. That's not a Walkman. That's not uh, a machine. That's Harry Potter. That's magic. That I can flip a finger and very rapidly and very frictionlessly get something that I wanted, something as magical and mysterious as music or conversation, that's pure magic. That's tapping in to basic human ambitions and dreams which go back to the beginning of time about dominating or having abilities above nature. You know, usually to play an instrument was very hard work. To lear try learning the piano, try learning the violin, try playing the tuba or the trumpet. Hard work, years of effort to get a decent result. Here, two clicks and magic happens. This is clearly about transcendent aspirations of people. This is close to magic. This is getting above nature itself. And so much of what Apple does, which designers often refer to as frictionless, is really about that. Frictionless means you're achieving things which were unimaginable previously with hardly any effort at all. Okay, So uh, Apple is a great example of that, and Apple is a great example of another thing, which is consistency about doing this over and over again in every touch point of their products. Uh, whether you use one product or the other, whether you look at the TV commercial or the page on the app, whether it's within the iStore or within the app itself, you tend to see a very strong consistency also in this, and that facilitates the emotional engagement. You feel a similar way and you tend to, to, to feel similar emotions at each touch point with the business, not just with the single button or the single piece of equipment or the single file of data. You tend to get this replication of the interaction and its characteristics and the emotions they will be stimulating. You tend to get a very similar set at all the touch points with the business and that consistency uh, creates great success for the business. And I'll stop there. I thank you once again for your time and patience with these discussions. I hope that some useful information about human emotions uh, comes out of today's discussion. I hope you find it of some use to you in your work. And I look forward to speaking with you again next week. Thank you.